Today I'm with Costa Collive, product consultant, entrepreneur. I know your, your mentor as well. Uh, thanks for joining our product leadership summit, Costa. Uh, thanks, Henry. Good, to, good to be here. Nice. So I think first question to jump straight in. Um, we, I mean, we've obviously had some conversation before, and I think where I look up to you actually when it comes to product leadership and, and where I, I feel like you have a really nice understanding is that sort of transition that startups go through. Mm. So maybe first question, um, what would you say the role, the core function of a product leader is in super early, you know, very early stage company versus let's say mm. as it starts achieving product market fit? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so I guess it's like, most product leadership at most early stage companies is directly the CEO because mm -hmm. they are the person that's come up with the idea of like, this is the product we should build. This is the customer we should build for. And a lot of the sales, a lot of the customer development, it comes from the founder uh, or the, the, the co-founders. Um, and it really starts there. And I think that the biggest difference for me between um, sort of early stage and sort of later stage when it comes to, you know, pre-product market fit and product market fit, I think is the waiting that we have on discovery versus delivery. Um, so early stage companies, it's, it's, it's basically all discovery. So it's like, we yeah. think we know who our customers are, but we need to spend a bunch of time figuring out which particular cohort within this broad set of millennials we're trying to target. Um, and we think that this is a, value, a couple of value propositions that they care about, but actually this one is the one that they care more, most about. And then this is the channel that we can reach more, most of them uh, via. So it's, it's just kind of like all these kind of basic assumptions that you kind of probably might start off in like yeah. a lean, lean canvas or, or a business model canvas to then really go into the detail and actually validating those assumptions. And your, your, your product expertise is really how well you can think through those assumptions and then how fast you can build the process around testing them. Yeah. And sort of once you find product market fit, it's really a lot of the bases are already covered. You know who your customers are, you know what product you're serving, uh, you know how to make that profitable, then it's all about scaling, right? So it's like we, we have, we sh our, our product roadmap should shift from, you know, we roughly know what we need to build for MVP over the next three months to actually we can take a slightly more long-term view because now we have enterprise customers or, you know, we have like yeah. high value customers and low value customers and we can actually start really being a lot more methodical in terms of how we deliver. Um, so it's really around the quality of focus on discovery and then focus on delivery. And I think those kind of shift on the gradient where yeah, yeah. you start off with, you know, sort of 80, 20. And then if you're, you know, really, really scaling, you probably flip to um, 80 to 20, 80 um, across those, those two axes. Yeah. It's really, really good points. And I, I mean, I think it's such a challenge when I, mean, I, I know from experience and you know, from experience that early stage, like just remembering that your role is not to jump in and build something that it is to just be, like very high level, very strategic, just speaking to customers lots of mm. times. And then that's where you're obviously sort of gradually building up this depth of knowledge about the yeah. customer, the problem space, or potential problem space, et cetera, mm. helping that evolve. Um, I mean, I talk a lot, I published a book last year actually on, on this. I talk a lot about the importance of things like being um, mindful, being uh, robust, and being able to focus on the essentials, like really key product yeah. skills. Like, do you see those or, or do you have your own sort of not mental models, but mental approach to that early stage that you mm. see in effective product leaders? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the best product people that I love working with tend to be people that have many different tools and they know which tool to get out of the tool belt when. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also very similar when you think about early stage, there's probably only a handful of things that are really, really crucial for you to yes. differentiate on, depending on your business model and on your target customer. Um, and, you know, you can, you can think about this really broadly and kind of like B2C, B2B. You can think this into, in terms of like, you know, are we largely an operational delivery kind of like organization or are we a SaaS product or are we a marketplace? And, you know, all these various different business models and various different industries and various different focuses in terms of B2B, B2C accentuate certain challenges more than others. And I think yeah. it's being able to have a strong intuition and a strong understanding of sort of business fundamentals in order to be able to focus at the right area in the right way. Um, and I think a lot of that is really understanding how much stuff should be, how much stuff should you actually try and productize both yeah. front of house and back of house or customer facing and internal versus how much stuff you should actually 
uh, take some time to figure out, okay, well, let's put a hundred people through this shoestring thing where we've, you know, built it with Zapier and Trello. Yeah, and then yeah. once we've kind of got those hundred through, we'll figure out what part we need to productize. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, it's always around, I think, just having the right tools for the right trade and understanding which, which of those kind of hurdles that really matter for, the, for that particular startup. Yeah, we talked about that a lot uh, last time we spoke. Yeah. Um, and I think actually very relevant today as well, mm. as you know, the, most of the audience is going to be junior, mid-level, mm. even senior PMs. And I know that your, strong, your views are quite strong on this. Mine are as well, <laughs> that you know, ultimately process helps, but it's not the most important thing. Maybe just, mm. just um, expand upon that or, or give your own views. Yeah, well, well I think this is the, the, the thing about process is that if we're honest, the way you say the word, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I think like, you know, if, if we're honest with ourselves, the challenge with early stage businesses is that they're almost always chaotic. So yeah. process is that thing that we can cling onto and, and lean back on. And it's the thing that gives us a little bit more certainty and security yeah. that we're, we're not completely, you know, wasting our time yeah. on, on this venture. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, it's such a good point. I mean, I talk about this a lot with students that, you know, ultimately things like Scrum are, are helpful in certain places, but, you know, really it's just about, are you asking the one or two right questions? Like, do we understand the customer do, and, and their problem? Uh, have we really thought through like the best way we might be able to solve this rather than just mm. sort of panicking and jumping into mm. building something that's over complex, for example? So, so, so I think that where, where process is genuinely really good, though, is, is I think in two ways, especially in, in the early days. Um, it's about giving yourself structure so you actually have those feedback loops where you don't spend too long doing the wrong thing because hopefully there's a, there's a reflection and then there's yeah. like, what did we learn? Okay, well, actually, we learned that all oh, this is shit. Let's scrap it. Let's, let's pivot. Yeah. Or, or ideally, it's all great. We need to double down on it. Um, or, or maybe some beautiful blend of the two, which is often where people get really, <laughs> really flustered. Um, but it, it, it's really around that kind of like, um, uh, cadence that allows you to, 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 ha to have that moment of reflection that allows you to course correct. Um, but I think it's also really important in terms of actually like as, as bad as it sounds, but documentation. Um, I think one of the challenges that a lot of people have when they're scaling up is that actually there's, there's a process, but people, and, and, you know, there's a product that's been built but no one can really understand why those decisions were made uh, yeah. unless we're there in the moment. Yeah. Um, and I think that a good process can actually generate some pretty helpful documentation and just like yeah. chronology of, you know, why certain big decisions were made such that yeah. when new people come on board, there's much more understanding around why stuff was built in the way that it was built. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. And uh, something I, you know, I really push, push, push with students is the importance of, a unique value proposition and how that is crystal or made concrete with a product vision statement uh, and you know not a company vision where it's you know mm. save a billion people kind of statement mm. but actually really concrete what is the you know the one or maybe two things that are really important mm. and then to not let that get crowded because obviously yeah. you know, the more feedback come in the more people you're hiring mm. the harder it is to stop noise coming in and distracting you from that you know that flag you've placed off in the off in the distance yeah um and i suppose that is true you know any stage of leadership right yeah i mean you kind of are custodian and leader of you know the the direction in which everyone is kind of like pulling towards um yeah. and the clearer and more specific and easier to digest that is um very often the the easier it is for people to fall in line and really go along with you on that journey. Yeah, yeah that's a really, really good point. I also love that idea of, um, that's something I haven't really cracked yet, which I, I, I like the way you described it, cadence over process in a way where, you know, coming back to things like um, Scrum Rituals or Agile with a capital C, um, like the reason why people do things like sprints and story points is, I mean, the goal of, sorry, the, the, the theory of it is very different to the reality of how it's practiced. And as you said, there tends to be a focus on um, optimizing for velocity and like how many story points can we get done versus actually delivery of value. And I suppose actually by stating that well, here's our cadence to give us a little bit of stability and here are the things that are actually important. You know, for example, what are we working on and why and what's the expected outcome? And then as you said, 
making sure that that is being reviewed um, on a regular basis or at the end of, of the cycle. Those are the things that really matter. And I suppose that those are the like, as you, you know, coming back to that, that idea you talked about of you have this toolkit, right? And it's, it's using what makes sense. And sometimes it's not bothering maybe being strict with process, but remembering the important things. It's like, what are we doing? Why? How do we know that it actually delivered value and the right kind of value as well? I mean, any specific, on that actually, any specific tips or like any specific process you use? I mean, it, yeah, it's it it really, it really, the toolkit. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it really depends who, who I'm speaking with and, and yeah. where I think they're, they're kind of like the biggest challenge are. I think that the one thing that it becomes easier, I guess, with, with experience and the more exposure that you have to more products is that your genuine intuition of like where the gaps are becomes stronger and sharper. And obviously yeah. there's a, there's an added risk where your, your biases also potentially become stronger and faster, but hopefully as a, as a product person or, or as product people, we're fairly good at like thinking through first principles and really just kind of being able to deconstruct stuff. Um, and especially when you're exposed to multiple new companies time and time again, yeah. your, your pattern recognition starts becoming, becoming quite interesting. But I think, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to forget process and in, in the new company that I'm currently building, we just came back off a retro and we just kind of realized shit, there was like, you know, a whole bunch of scope creep um, in our last release. And that actually, you know, drained the team quite badly. And just because, you know, you've been doing this stuff for 10 years doesn't mean that you, once, like, you know, you might fall into some rookie areas yourself. Um, well, I think that's- 100%. I mean, like I, I have an example as well where we changed sort of week four to six of the program to focus yeah. on no code digital prototyping and mm. like how to, how to start measuring product market fit and inform mm. your roadmap before committing to like a full code solution. Mm. Same thing, I like look back, I'd spent like a month doing this, like no code pro tutorials, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Afterwards you get the feedback, everyone's like, yeah, first week, awesome. Last two weeks, I like, could have been better. Wasn't sure why, you know, we went so in depth with no code and, you know, after you're just like, oh my God, like I'm teaching this stuff and you, you catch yourself making the same mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard. I mean, that, that's another great lesson though, isn't it? I think for aspiring product leaders is that you're never going to get this. It is, it is genuinely a continuous learning process because as, as you said, you know, you think you've cracked something, you maybe apply the same process you used in your last company and then, Surprise, surprise, the world has changed or the context is different, solutions yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Any, um, I think that, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just gonna quick, quickly add a note where I think like this is, this is often I think a big challenge as well where I, th I, I see it happening at companies quite a lot of times where someone gets brought in in a, in a, in a senior product position at a stage of maturity of the company and they just kind of bring to them all the process and all the culture from their, uh, you know, previous place yeah. of work. And they also get the mandate from leadership to like, well, you're brought in because you've done it at a bigger company. Therefore, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> like t t do like build a process that makes sense. And I think very often, I think it's like, you know, we, we have to think about the, the internal process and the internal culture and the way that we kind of make decisions and really do it at a case by case basis, because very often the transition from one company to another, you'll just end up, annoying people and, and not and making and not allowing people to buy into into uh, into the structure and the kind of i guess uh pedagogy that you're trying to bring over yeah yeah i mean that ties in as well to something i mean something relevant to life generally that happens everywhere but that's in miss um what's the word for it ultimately like misunderstanding the root cause of something or the you know, yeah. you know for example like, luck plays a massive part timing all of these things and you know even with culture like maybe it's just the subtle way that the founders interacted that set the initial sort of ball rolling with culture mm. um and i think just being humble and realizing that like you can't control that much and a lot of the things you think you understand you probably don't understand um you really yeah really important just to stay sort of as you said always going back to first principles always trying to sort of stay detached from things um, I know because I, I listened to your podcast on <laughs> talking about meditation, sort of self-management. Like, yeah. There are any, you know, there's a theme that both of us are clearly mm. think is important, right? Which is mm. maybe not mindfulness itself, but being able to see things as clearly as possible. Yeah. Are there any specific 
tactics, things that you do on a daily basis to make sure you can stay detached? I mean, honestly, I think it's, it's, it's just around, it's very, like the longer that you spend building something, the more your, your biases accrue. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just around base, being able to proactively have a network of, a support network around you that you can reach out to, that you can ask for help, that you can ask for someone just to kind of like give you an impartial opinion. It's like, hey, look, you know, this is kind of, this is what we have. And this is kind of what's on our roadmap and having someone go, wait, why are you investing six months into building this? Yeah. <laughs> and go, yeah well, you know, it's because we, yeah. we were talking <laughs> yeah. about it for a long time. And yeah. it's like, wait, wait, how's that got to do you anything? Realize, you realize, I had one last week, same thing. You realize as you're saying it, I can't, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, really, I think, as well, sorry, I'm, I'll just on that to recap it. Like, yeah. you don't need to, you know, things don't need a difficult solution at times, do they? Just having a conversation with even I find like having a pint with a friend or something that's completely not in tech or entrepreneurship is helpful because you're you're also having to simplify things and, and not use you know clever terms um, and then you start you know thinking through your thought process which mm. is cool. yeah no for sure definitely um, and yeah I mean any other tactics or advice for people looking to get into product or product leadership roles I mean I think product is genuinely really easy and really tough at the same time. And I think a lot of people have a misconception around like, oh, you know, you get to be the CEO of the product and, uh, you know, you get to uh, build stuff and, and you know, you, it's, it's like this very diverse job. And all of the highlights are also all of the lowlights. Um, like most people in product know that they're a subservient leader to everyone around them and they actually hold very little um, decision making power aside from being able to influence stuff um, yeah. at, le at, at least as st like stuff begins to grow um, and on top of that you know having ability to speak to design and speak to growth and speak to you know business development and customer success and engineering and uh, QA that is marvelous but also it can be incredibly annoying and difficult and exhausting just because you're trying to like keep so many people happy um, yeah. and I think like one of the one of the best skills that I think people that are getting into product management can learn is how to say no gracefully without offending anyone. Yeah. Um, because it's, it, it's a skill that, you know, if you're building something successful is going to become more and more relevant as you know, the number of internal and external stakeholders that you have to manage uh, starts growing exponentially. Yeah. I mean, no one also coming just tying back to what we started talking about sort of product vision value proposition. Like you have to say no, if you want to build something good or great, like you have to keep it focused. Um, no, I think I think that's a great place to finish. Um, yeah, really nice advice. Actually, like every time I speak to you, I, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> like honestly, no exaggeration. Very kind. Thanks. Um, yeah, I love I love that idea of the cadence as well. Just remembering the importance of that. Um, Costa, is there anywhere you want anyone to follow you? <laughs> Obviously not physically. <laughs> uh, your podcast, I know. Uh, yeah, just connect with me on LinkedIn. That's probably that's probably the best way to just to, to find me and engage. Cost the colour. So I'm going to post your LinkedIn link when I send out the the uh, episode. Awesome. Well, look, thanks great. so much for the time. Uh, pleasure as always. And uh, thanks, Henry. Sure we'll see you soon.